Gregory Harold, and he has a story that is unbelievable. And of course, that's what the show is. Do you believe? <laughs> so he has an unbelievable story, and um, this is our guest. This is Gregory Harold, author of The Alien Connection. Welcome. Let's welcome Gregory to the show. Thanks so much for joining me tonight and our viewers. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me. Oh my God! I, I when I found out about what happened to you, I was so excited I couldn't stand it. So, um, do you want to um, just give them a, a first a little introduction? Yeah, uh, I think a, a little brief background. I'll kind of try to move along with that pretty quickly because you got a lot of things to cover. But uh, the story is more than just about getting uh, pictures on film. You know, it actually provides evidence of another life form that's invisible to us. That seems to be either present on this earth or maybe uh, passing through a different dimension getting here. But anyway, literally hundreds of the pictures appeared on film, you know, over a six year period. And uh, the pictures that you're going to see are a sampling of a lot of them. But uh, they consist of aliens, what I believe to be alien spacesuits, uh, alien entities, orbs. Of course, everybody has pictures of orbs, but these are a little different. Uh, surveillance probes, objects that appear and disappear over time, and uh, strange faces that change size and appearance that seem to look directly into the camera. Um, the pictures were taken uh, between 1974 and 1980 in Palm Springs, Florida. And the reason the pictures were taken was, um, after we were there a few years, we started to get vandalism outside of our house during the night. Uh, shrubs were being killed, and uh, we had some uh, stuff thrown on the cars and things like that. And I don't mean to imply that aliens did these things. It was more of a two-legged human thing, I think, you know. But anyway, that's the reason the camera was set up, to try to find whoever was doing that. And uh, we did report it to the police, but the, they said they needed some kind of evidence, so we, that was the best place to start. Hey, Gregory, when, when this was happening, were there any... any um audio taking place? Did you hear any voices or clicking or anything like that? Yeah, during the night, didn't hear any clicking or voices, but during the night sometimes you would hear, uh, like, uh, it sounded like it was coming from maybe next door, like one, two o'clock in the morning. Sometimes you'd hear like water going into a bucket and it was like somebody's mixing stuff up. Really? And, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. And, uh, um, but other than that, there wasn't really any noise going on. That was about it. And uh, so we, we really uh, didn't know what was going on. Uh, somebody didn't like something or whatever, whatever they were doing, but that's a different story altogether. Uh, what happened when I set up the camera, um, would act surveillance camera where you can take pictures every at different increments, and I sent them at four second intervals. The reason for that was if somebody wanted to come into the yard, do some damage and get back out, I'd at least get them on two or three frames of film because the camera was taking pictures every four seconds. And uh, we didn't get anything for um, a month or two. And after that, I, I finally started getting pictures. Now, Gregory, now, one other, this took place, did you tell them it took place in Florida? Yes. This was your home in Florida, okay. Yeah. And i uh, also like to point out that I never saw anything and I really never heard anything. Um, the only way I found out was after I would, you'd, you'd have to take the Super 8 film and send it in for developing because they didn't, they weren't doing that locally. And two or three weeks after you did that, you'd get the film back. Then I'd look it over with a hand viewer and I'd see these things on the film. And, and uh, unless you went real slow, you'd miss them. You'd go right by, you wouldn't see them. But anyway, when I recognized that there was something on there that was real, I started to, uh, take them very slowly, and uh, what I got was, uh, I think on the, uh, uh, let me see, uh, I think what I got on the first picture was... Oh, do you uh, want me to show the first picture? Yeah, that would be good. Okay. There were four images on the first roll, and uh, what, you, what you will see is um, the first image of the four. Now, these were taken at four seconds apart. Now, what the images did, there it is on, on the film. Um, what 
the images did, when it went from one, I got the second picture, the third picture, they changed in appearance. They were similar, but they changed in appearance. Now, if you're looking at the picture, the, uh, the top looks like a helmet. Uh, there's a spotlight in the yard that's shining down on the helmet. Uh, it appears to have a wing on the body section and it looks like an arm coming out of the body with a forearm that is in a vertical position. And if you could see up near the top, it's, uh, you can't see it too good on the picture, it's small. But the, uh, it looks like two little fingers gripping onto something coming off the helmet. Now, when that thing, and I, I point out, it appeared that it came down, this is going to sound kind of strange, but it appeared that it, it came down like in a uh, transporter beam, like a, a cylinder of some sort. And you could see these things look like they were stacked on top of each other, something like you would see in a totem pole. And when it got down to the bottom, it would pop out and go to another position, but it would take on a little different appearance. Then on the next one, it would take on a different appearance, and the next one a different appearance. Now, what it did in between those four seconds, I don't know. I wish I had been able to take it every second. You know, then I would get more pictures. But I'm pretty sure it was the same thing, just changing in appearance. That and, uh, is that is so weird looking. Yeah. I, I, I can't. I, it, it, so they're wearing a suit of some kind and some kind of helmet and whatever. Yeah, I didn't know that at first. At first, when I first saw the pictures, I thought it was little kids in wearing football helmets going across the yard. So how but, tall? About what? How tall do you think they were? Oh, and they were about uh, three feet tall. Uh, they were about three feet off the ground. Uh, they were about one foot in diameter. And uh, I didn't know what to make of it. I, I didn't know anything about photography, and I didn't. it was dark when they were taken, so I figured I didn't see anything on the bottom, like pants or legs or anything, so I figured, well, it's probably because there's not enough light out there and I wasn't getting the full picture. Yeah. But the reason I thought it was kids was because one of the neighbors said little kids are about five, six years old, uh -huh. seven years old. And he used to have him running around in football helmets all the time because he was a big football guy. Yeah. And I'm thinking, well, you know, that's crazy, you know. But at the time, I didn't know any differently, so I just let it go. And eventually, I found out that he, uh, one of the reporters looked at it, at the picture, and they said it was uh, definitely not kids. So from that point on, I, I kind of kept filming. Whenever there was damage in the yard, I would just run the camera. And it wasn't like I got pictures every day or every week or every month. Sometimes I would get pictures once a month, then a month would go by, you wouldn't get any, then you'd get another roll with more pictures on it. And uh, so I kept doing that. And this was taken in the first week of November in 1974. Then that, uh, we can go into photo two. Okay. And that would be the second week of November, if you want to show that one. Yeah, here's photo if two. You, that would be number two. That was, uh, it's a picture of a yeah it this is a blown up picture of the image that was in the beam at the top of the beam again it had the transporter beam it was about 15 feet off the ground this is the image that was at the top of the beam now you can see the top looks like a helmet um, yeah it looks like it's got some kind of face in there it could be a face or it couldn't be a face. It, it, it does. Like, it does. It looks like it looks like there's a face behind a helmet of some kind. Yeah, yeah, that's what I that's what I started thinking, well this is a suit. It's not actually a, a thing, it's gotta be a suit. You know, there's something inside the suit. Oh my god. Now and you the, now you try now Gregory contacted MUFON and tell them what happened. Well, I gave them, a, I contacted them and I gave them a, a picture of an alien type image. It isn't this one, but uh, I asked them to look at it and they, and they gave it to an analyst and they said, uh, it looks like it's a squiggle because the camera moved or it might be dust or something like that. And that wasn't the case. And I got tried to get back to them. I said, well, I'll give you more information if you need the information or I can get together with you and I can show you what I have. And I just, they just never responded. They never answered any more emails or anything. They kind of wrote it off, I guess, after the uh, first analysis. Good. So I didn't do any more with them. 
But this thing was sitting on top of the, a similar beam that the first set was, uh, that would be a, a week before. And uh, it's very clear. And, and what it doesn't show on here, there's, it looks like an alien entity that's next to it. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of that. I didn't furnish you with one. Um, but uh, that's shown in the DVD, and it's shown also in the book. The book is in more detail. Yeah, that is... I've, I have never seen anything like this before, ever. You're the first one. And when I found you on Facebook, because I had seen you, you had posted something on somebody else's Facebook page, because I didn't know anything about you. And then, oh my God, I couldn't wait to have you on the show. Holy cow, this is crazy. Let's go to the next one now. Okay, well, this was the second week in November. Now, the third week in November, here comes a bunch more pictures. I've got, there were five frames on the, um, on the third week of November, and um, they can they uh, look very similar to the ones on the first week. Now this one on the screen, that looks very similar to the first picture taken during the first week, except here's the funny part. It almost looks like somebody fabricated it. It looks like, instead of the first picture where you have a really clear picture of a forearm coming up, two fingers holding onto the helmet, this one doesn't. It has some kind of stick thing coming up. You can't see any fingers. The helmet looks clear. The, the body part looks like it's wrapped in cloth or something. It doesn't, it looks fake. Oh, yeah. So I don't know what was going on with that one. Well, you can clearly see a helmet. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. Now, the second picture, it, it did like the other film. It moved and it changed, it changed its appearance. The third picture went to something totally different. I wish I could show everybody all the pictures, but we wouldn't have time for all that, and we aren't set up for it right now. But the fourth picture was different again, and the fifth picture resembled, it almost looked like a dog with legs that were closer to the, right under the head some way. I know it sounds crazy, yeah. but that, that's, you know, that's the way it is. But, uh, <laughs> again, these are four seconds apart. Oh my God, oh my God, I, 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 I just, I can't believe it. I have never seen anything like this posted anywhere. Yeah, I've, there aren't any because I've, um, I've been at this two or three years now and I've sent these, sent pictures all over the place to people all over the world and they've never seen them either. They just, uh, they don't know what to think of it. Oh my God. I don't really know what to think of it either. I don't either. Shall we go to, let's go to the, um, let's go to four. Okay. Uh, two years, in, in the interim between 1974 and 1977, I still got pictures, but a lot of the pictures came down. You couldn't really relate to anything that we could associate with. It was like uh, they were there, but if you show them to somebody, it would just look like, hey, that's a blimp on the film, or, or maybe it's a reflection or something like that. But the next good one came in 1977. And what you see now on the screen is a picture of a thing that is very similar to the first two. It has the helmet. It has the vertical rod that goes up and down. It has a body section. So, also, okay, that, that rod, um, huh? is that the rod that like maybe they're coming up and down from, in and out from their ship? Yeah, I kind of, I kind of think that because it might have been in the beam, you know, on the other yeah. picture. It looks like he's hanging onto that, so it's not. I don't think it's a solid rod. That's well. Wait a minute. Maybe that rod is what brought them down into your air, into your backyard. But why your backyard? I don't get it. I don't get it either. I have no why idea. Why you of all people? And you had did you and did you check with other your neighbors if they were getting anything? No, I wouldn't do that because, like, we were having the vandalism problems, uh -huh. and I'm not, but I did what I did do. I took some of these uh, pictures, and I showed them to a reporter, uh -huh. and she had the, uh, she checked out the film with Kodak, and they said nothing was wrong with the film. They didn't know what it was, but it wasn't the film or the camera, as far as they knew, and uh, so from that point on, I just, every time there was a little damage around the yard, I would take pictures. It just happened that way because... It was expensive to run these things all the time, oh. the kids buying the film and getting them developed. 
and uh, it, they seem to be related to whenever damage occurred. I don't know if I can say 100% that's true, but that's how I took pictures. Whenever a little damage I found, I put the camera on, took pictures, and sometimes we got more of these, and sometimes we didn't get any. Hey, did you ever think about um, staying up all night and have a, 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 video, a, a video camera or a still camera ready for this? They didn't have those then. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, okay? <laughs> Too yeah, bad. Actually, I did. And that's, I did try staying up to see if I could see anybody coming in there, but I had to go to work the next day. You know, and yeah. uh, I couldn't... Um, I, uh, the best way I could handle it was buy a camera and try to stick it up there and see if I could catch something on the film. And that's, that's basically what happened. But now, you know, the thing is... It, it, <sighs> Okay, so even if, okay, so you did so did you did stay up all night some nights to try and see if you could see them? I didn't stay up all night. I stayed up till two or three o'clock some nights to see if I could see them. I wonder if they knew you were there and so they wouldn't come. I don't know. I kind of think they wanted. They knew the camera was there. I'm pretty sure. They maybe didn't know it at first, but I think after that they might have. Okay, let's go on to uh, let's go on to the to the next oh. one. Whoops. Okay. We can't along because time's running, but uh, when, I want to point out that this particular figure didn't come down a beam. It came from the yard behind our house. And but it, it looks from, like it's on a. But it looks like it's on that rod. Well, it's holding the rod or it's hanging onto the rod, but it came through the wooden fence toward the house. It passed. It looks like it passed right through the wooden fence. Oh, that's that is just bizarre. Okay, now, the next one was yeah. taken in 1979, I believe. Uh, this, is, this is even more bizarre. It's different than the first ones. Yeah. What is it? Well, this one is it's, uh, it's B-405. It's a cylinder. It starts out as a cylinder that's closed, and it looks like it's got a helmet on the top. Now, what you're looking at in this picture is the helmet opens up like an alligator mouth. It moves all the way up, and when it's open, I show an arrow up there where it looks like a face in there. I don't know whether it's a face or not, but what happened was the helmet separates from the body of the suit, and the an alien entity drops out of the suit. Oh, my God. The suit disappears. Then as the entity goes toward the ground, when it's near the ground, it looks very much like a ghost. Oh, my God. Oh, so, Wow. Right, let's go on to uh, the next one. Okay. Um, I, I personally think from watching all these things that ghosts and spirits and aliens and, and Bigfoots and all that are all related to the same thing. But anyway, uh, now this one is uh, in 1980. I uh, thought I would put some of these pictures in. A, I put them in a National Enquirer because they had a big circulation. And I figured, well, okay, uh, maybe somebody will see this thing or make a response. Well, I got a letter back from a guy in Chicago who had taken five pictures with his Polaroid camera of a full moon in the front of his house. And this is what he got. He got five pictures of this kind of stuff. But at the time, I didn't know what it was. So I wrote back to him and I said, I don't know what it is. I don't have anything like that. But I really did, but I didn't know it because it's the little pictures. What you see on here on the right is a picture I took in 1974. I stacked it one behind the other. The picture on the left is the one in the Chicago picture that he sent me in 1980. To me, they look pretty much identical. It's like these little spacesuit guys are stacked on top of one another. Oh, so one side is yours and one side is his picture? The one on the right side, I, I constructed that out of, the, out of the picture I got. Oh, my I God. One behind the other. And the other one is a picture he got in Chicago that's stacked on behind the other. Oh my god, it's almost identical. Yeah, they look almost identical. Oh, wow. And were they coming in his backyard as well? Uh, he didn't know what they were. He just got those pictures on his Polaroid camera. Oh, oh. He was taking pictures of the moon. Oh my god. Okay, let's go on to the next picture. Okay, now I noticed, I noticed after a while, a few years of doing this, that I would get more pictures when the, when the film was running low in the camera and there was a red light, warning light on in the camera. Oh. So I decided, okay, I'll wait till the camera runs out. Then I'll go into about 8 o'clock at night, leave the camera running, go out there and just walk around and see what happens. Hmm. Well, we did that. 
on two or three different occasions. This is the first one. Now I refer to that object on the uh, on the screen as a big chair, but I know it's not a chair. It just it looks like it has two front legs, a rear leg, and a high back and a seat. And what that object did when it when it was falling, it came from above and rotated 90 degrees as it went lower, and it looked like it went right into the bush. Into the I don't know if it like went into the ground. That's what happened with that one. Now at the time. You know, uh, we were watching it. We didn't see anything. I didn't find that out two or, two or three weeks later. Wow. That wasn't the only time. It happened again. But this time it was with different type mechanical looking objects. Oh, wow. That is crazy. Let me get to... Um, so that's seven. So now we need eight. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Okay, on... Uh, it's eight. Eight, I call it surveillance probes because... What you can't see on, on, on one picture, like I say, I have several pictures of these, but we don't have time to put them all up. Um, the object comes down, and you, the, this was the, uh, the first picture you see. What, it looks like I'm looking at it. Uh-huh. You see it. And then uh, uh, the next picture I have of that particular image, it changes shape, and it rotates 90 degrees, and it looks like a parabolic-type antenna-type thing with two, two sticks on the side. Now, you don't have the picture of that, but that's what that picture looks like when it rotates. You can see that better in the book, and you can see it real well on the DVD. And you can see it on the other still pictures, but we just don't have those up tonight. Yeah. Okay, let's go to number nine. Number nine is the, uh, this is a picture where my daughter and I were standing in the yard, just looking around, doing the same thing with the camera running. And what happened was, it looked like the yard split in two vertically. It looks like on the right side, that looks like our yard. On the left side... There's a large image on the left side. I don't know whether that's a big house. It kind of resembles that helmet-type suit, yeah. only it's huge. And it's split right down the middle. And the object on the left, as you go through the, f the frames on the film, it appears and disappears. Appears and disappears. Just the left-hand side of the picture behind us. Wow. It's like it's either coming from another dimension, or I can't imagine. Oh my God. Okay, let's go to 10. This one is freaky. Let's okay, 10 is uh, large faces. Now what happened with this is, on some frames on the, on the film, there's a little image that appeared right in front of the camera. It looked like it was about six inches high. So what happened was, that uh, that doesn't show the little image, but what happened was, this thing started real small in the yard. It got bigger and bigger until it filled up the whole camera. God. Oh my God. You can clearly see it's an, a face. And like you said, you, uh, the hand looks like it's leaning on its face. Like, because this part is curled and you can see it. It looks like, that's what it looks like. It's not a pretty face, but it's no. a face. <laughs> It's scary. <laughs> I wouldn't want to run into it, I'll tell you that. <laughs> there are oh. several of these. Um, several different kinds of pictures, big ones. Oh. They're not that, like that one. Oh. And, uh, Did you get frightened when you saw this image? You know, no, because uh, it isn't like I saw it. You know, it's like a time delay thing. You knew it was on film, but by the time you got the film back, it was two or three weeks later, and I didn't really know what it was. You know, I had that time to really, uh, you know, I couldn't imagine what it was. You know, so I just kind of put it away, and before you know it, uh, you'd take film and nothing would come back. Then you'd take some more film and you'd get something else back. There's a lot of different areas that, that were filmed. We've only covered a couple of them, but um, if you want to move on to the next oh, one. Oh, yeah, let's go on to the next one. I call them orbs or UFOs. Uh, that would be uh, photo 11, I guess. This one's uh, 11. Yeah. Um, that was a picture, I believe... That's not up yet. I believe it's a big orb. It is. Okay. This thing was about, it looks like it's about four to five feet in diameter. It's a little more elliptical than round. But uh, it, um, I have a film after this. Yeah, and let me go to the next one because that is not an orb. What you are seeing right now is definitely not an orb. And we'll show you the next, the last picture and you'll see why. So let me show that one. This thing eventually uh, left the area, and it wasn't covered with white light. It was. It looked solid. 
Now that's really got me puzzled because I didn't think these were solid, but like UFOs, they may be solid, but they're probably covered with a white type light. Now on, this came in as a white light and the white light went away and it turned into a solid object. Yeah. Now here's the difference. This, this orb here was about 10 or 15 feet in the yard up high. It moved, started, and I, I looked at the flat bottom and I thought it was getting cut off by the fence, but the thing came down and sat right in front of the camera. On another occasion, right below that, there's um, there's what looks like a space, like a platform with human heads coming off the platform. Yeah. And, uh, it was right below this this orb, and in the orb you could see an alien entity, either coming in or going out. I don't have a picture of that on here, but that's what it was. And below that, about ten feet, was this little little um, platform with the faces on. Do you have a, a, a photo thirteen? A what? Thirteen, another oh, picture. Oh, um. Is that the last one? I only had twelve. Okay. Well, the last one was the platform that sat behind it, underneath this. That was up about fifteen, twenty feet. The platform was about ten foot under it. It had four, looked like four human heads coming off the platform. Now, now I do have this picture. Uh, I don't know what it is. Here, let me show it. What's this one that you sent me? Okay, it's not up yet. Uh, okay. Here it comes. Oh, that's uh, that's off of the uh, my website. Oh, okay. Was this was an alien entity coming out of a transporter beam? That, and around the right, it shows one of the spacesuits from the second week, and it shows a, it takes a different. The alien entity is in some kind of protective suit. The one on the bottom is the suit that separates from the helmet. The alien entity comes out of that. Wow. The third one on the bottom is the one that looks like a face, and I said there was an alien entity next to it. Yeah. That looks like. Those two on the right is what it actually looks like. Wow. Well, you know what? We've run out of time. Okay. Uh, I hope you enjoyed Harold's story because it is just unbelievable. Now, Harold, do you want to give them um, information on your YouTube and your website? Let me uh, show your book and the book. The book is absolutely awesome. I have a copy myself. Okay, on the website, it's just www.gregoryherald.com, no space. Uh, YouTube channel, you can go to YouTube and type in Gregory Herald with a space between it. And there's about 30 or 40 film clips on, the, on YouTube if you want to visit that site. And, uh, of course, the Alien Connection is, it, is very detailed and has a lot more pictures and, uh, of the stuff we've been talking about. Harold's Mystery is... Uh, takes it one step further and it's a narrated DVD. There's the DVD. All of the film clips in there and they're explained in detail. So you get a very good idea. Yeah, awesome. If wants to contact me, they can either go to my website and leave me a comment, I'd appreciate that. Or uh, if they want to make comments on any individual YouTube films, that's fine too. Awesome. Thank you so much. I hope you all enjoyed Gregory. And Gregory, thank you so much for being my guest tonight. I, I was just so excited to have you on the show. And thank you. And um, I'm hoping to, uh, to help you with the exposure of this. Um, yeah, well, very intriguing. I'll say that for you. Absolutely awesome. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening. And I'll, I'll be speaking with you shortly. Okay. Well, thank you again. Oh, thank you. Good night. Okay, just a second, guys. Okay, everybody, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I, I mean, I think his story is absolutely fascinating. I, I loved it. Um, just one second, bear with me. Our next guest is um, our next guest is uh, Joshua Shapiro. Uh, he's the author. He's an author, a researcher, explorer of crystal skulls. Now this was another one. I'm so excited. I can't wait to talk with him. So let me um, let me get him on uh, Skype here.
Hello, oh, this is Joshua. Uh, hi, Joshua. Thank you for joining me tonight on our show. And um, everybody, this is Joshua Shapiro, and he is the uh, ex foremost. Um, let me have my notes here. You are the expert on the crystal skulls. You're the foremost expe expert in the field of crystal skulls. You're an author, explorer, and a researcher. Now, can you just give me a little background on you and, and how you got involved in this? Sure, Noreen. Um, <clears throat> well, probably like most of your listeners, there was a period of time where I became interested and had experiences with what we're calling today now the paranormal. And uh, I'm a person that likes to understand reality, what's going on around me. And I'm also an Aries. So anytime there's an opportunity to have a different kind of experience, then I'm going to go into it. I'm going to see what it's about. But I'm also a person who shares. So anytime I have a very unique experience, uh, I'm fortunate that I'm a somewhat a good writer and communicator, then I share with people what happened. So in 1983, I was just kind of traveling on faith in California, and I had an opportunity to meet a crystal skull, one that many people consider to be quite old. And I had some very powerful experiences with it, but also the crystal skull uh, kind of awakened inside of me a knowingness, which I think comes from many other lifetimes, that the crystal skulls are vital to the future of humanity. So that's pretty much how I started. And then once I met that crystal skull, I brought some other people to see it. and. I started to um, continue to travel and I met more crystal skulls and now here we are pretty much uh, 29 plus years later and I've seen who knows how many hundreds thousands of different crystal skulls all over the world and I have never changed that feeling that I received when I first saw this crystal skull which is called a me an amethyst skull that was about eight pounds that they are very important and it's kind of like since 1983, a lot of people now have caught up with this because all of a sudden, a lot of people now, they want to have their own crystal skull. They had crystal skulls in the Indiana Jones film, and it, it's kind of taken off, and more and more people are very interested and excited to know more about that. So that's pretty much how I started. Wow. Now, you know, I have a lot of questions for you. Um, now, you're also a partner with Katrina Head. Is, is that right? Yes, Katrina and I uh, worked together very closely. We met in Atlanta in 2009, and we call ourselves affectionately the Crystal Skull Explorers. And so, you know, if people want to learn more about what we're doing, all they have to do is look up Crystal Skull Explorer or Explorers on Google, and they'll, they'll find us all over the place. And uh, so what happens is she has her own experiences and a different perception about what the crystal skulls are about and I think it's important that people kind of get this double approach from a man and from a woman uh, because I think to have contact with crystal skulls you really have to be open to working with your feminine energy which is where your spiritual gifts come from so she actually with the personal crystal skulls we have she hears them like how you and I are talking we can hear each other's voice uh -huh. she hears the voices of the skulls so uh, we work very well together and it's very important that we work together in order to share the different type of uh, perceptions. Wow. Now, um, I also have some questions. Now, there was, here let me put this up, there was, um, there's something about um, these 13 skulls and there's one that hasn't been found yet? Well, related to the to the concept or the idea of 13 original skulls, there are a lot of different theories about this. And Katrina and I have our own perception of it. So first, maybe for your listeners, let me define the idea, and then I'll try to explain where we're coming from, because um, we see things a little bit different than the way you're asking the question. Um, there was um, a, a master researcher who came out who actually I worked with for my first book, 
Mystery of the Crystal Skulls Revealed, F.R. Nick Nasserino, who started the Crystal Skull Society back in the 1940s. And he had some visions about a master set of 13 crystal skulls working together. So I believe kind of like as he was sharing this, other people, either they had their own visions or there were purportedly a concept of legends coming from different indigenous people. Because there are a number of different indigenous tribes who talk about uh, either they have in their possession or they've had legends about these crystal skulls and they consider them to be sacred objects. So I believe uh, this became more popular when Morton and Thomas wrote their book, A Mystery of the Crystal Skull, which came out, I think it was in the early part of uh, the 1990s. Uh, all of a sudden, a lot of people were talking about that there is an original set of 13 crystal skulls or 13 master skulls. Right. Now, the idea of 13 comes up in many world religions, like in the religion I was brought up in Judaism. Uh -huh. You have the Levites, the priests, and the 12 tribes of Israel. With, uh, in Christianity, you have the Christ and the 12 apostles. Matter of fact, I read a book called He Walk the Americas, where different indigenous tribes were talking about a Christed person they were meeting about the time when Christ existed. And he was um, finding 12 people in the tribe that he was putting together to continue the teachings. And I also believe in our solar system, we very well could have 12 planets going around the sun, which would also include, uh, well, the nine that we know, and then there are some people who are pretty sure there's another planet beyond Mercury, which sometimes they call Vulcan. And an early UFO contactee by the name of George Hunt Williamson, who I've read many of his books and had a brief contact with him, he talked about there could be two planets before Mercury in front of the Sun, which are so close to the Sun that it's not possible to actually, you know, see the planet. Mm -hmm. So, so this is the concept that there are this uh, master set, original set of 13 skulls. But for Katrina and I, we believe, and this is more from soul wisdom, and if your listeners understand what I'm talking about, that it's more of they have not come out yet, none of them, because we feel that whoever made these very advanced skulls, they are so advanced in the energy that's connected to them that if a human being was to be in their presence at this point in time, they literally could disintegrate. The vibrational frequency that these master skulls are emanating is of such a high frequency that it, it, I think they're, they exist more in other dimensions, maybe slightly removed from our own. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not feeling that any of those skulls uh, come out. Now, there is a new book I'm going to come out with probably prior to, as I've discussed with you, we have just announced an online Crystal Skull Conference that we're going to be offering on December 1st and December 2nd. And before we finish today, we'll give some information. We have a website people can go to. Uh, there's a book that I have... Uh, written, but I'm finishing editing it and, and getting pictures into it that's going to be called uh, Journeys of the Crystal Skull Explorers Travelogue Number 2, The Search for the Blue Skull in Peru. Now, between 1997 and 2002, I was in, I don't know, some other state of, of mind or some really strange things were happening to me where I was being pulled to go to Peru to look for a specific crystal skull, which even to this day, even in this moment as I think about it, I see it in my mind's eye as a, a human looking skull, two pieces, similar to the famous Mitchell Hedges crystal skull, or one like we have, which is called Rosalita, oh, made yeah. by Master Carver in China. It has a removable jaw with the top part of the skull. And I have seen a vision in my mind's eye for many years of this crystal skull. No. I, I believe I have a picture of it. Well, I don't know if there really is any picture of it. Well, um, it's labeled Rosalita. Oh yeah, Rosalita, there's a picture of yeah, it. Yeah, let me well, show them that. Yeah, so this would give people an idea of, of the skull that I'm kind of seeing in my mind's eye. And, um, you know, what it is... 
I can't say, you know, if this blue skull exists or not, but it, it, it's extremely real for me, and um, I think that it may be connected to these uh, very old or original 13 skulls, because where I was drawn to go see it was high up in the Andes Mountains in Peru near the border with Ecuador, and in this area, the local people say they have legends about Lumeria, as if this part of the world used to be part of Lemuria before the Andes Mountains rose and the continent of Lemuria sank under the water, which could have been, I don't know, 50 or 100,000 years ago or something like that. So uh, it's very difficult to be able to offer proof or evidence you know, about these 13 skulls. You have the legends from the indigenous people. You have uh, people who are following a spiritual path that have a feeling around this. Um, even at the conference, we have a lady who's purportedly in contact with the consciousness that represents these 13 skulls. And she has a new book coming out, which she's going to be one of our speakers. So it comes up a lot, but exactly what's going on with it, you know, who has the right answer is difficult to say. So I would say from our perspective, we do not believe that any of these skulls, of the 13 original, if they do exist and if the number is 13, you know, it could be 24 or 26, that they're actually known yet. Really? But, okay. Yeah. You know, now, you. I also pulled up some information that you said uh, uh, possibly uh, extraterrestrial origin? Yes. Um, there are different theories that people have as far as you know, where did these crystal skulls come from? And one of the theories is, is that perhaps the crystal skulls were gifts from the gods, which would be extraterrestrials. That maybe the extraterrestrials thought, if we provide for humanity these uh, objects that look like a human bone skull, let's say, that is charged with energy, has knowledge inside of it, that these tools could assist humanity in helping them in their spiritual evolution. Because what I believe is happening, and there's many other people, I mean, we're in 2012 now, we have so-called the Mayan calendar ending uh, not too long from now, like in about two months, it's supposed to be ending. Um, I think that um, the extraterrestrials have been involved with humanity for a very long time, uh, like I know the gentleman that just spoke before, he was showing some evidence of contact that he was having. And uh, many people are having contact with an intelligence which seems to originate, you know, from outside the earth, from another dimension, or even some people talk about contact with people that are from civilizations under the ground, like Telos at Mount Shasta, or possibly there could have been an underground city where I was looking for the blue skull in a mountain that I went to go, or the hollow earth, which would be the idea the earth is hollow and there's these advanced people that live on the inner surface of the earth. But the crystal skulls have been, you know, every time we're doing research and we're talking with people and they're telling us about their experiences with them or we're talking with some indigenous people, the UFOs come up. Or, you know, like sometimes people are working with crystal skulls and UFOs may show up in the area where maybe they're doing a ceremony or so on. So um, this is one of the things we believe is that there probably most definitely is some kind of extraterrestrial or an advanced civilization that may be dimensional or extraterrestrial that um, placed these skulls here on the earth long ago as a tool to assist humanity to awaken to who we are. Now, also, um, I saw on your website that you categorize the crystal skulls. There's ancient, there's old crystal skulls, there's contemporary skulls. Um, those are the three categories that I that I saw. So, why, what, what, what are they? Why are they different categories? Okay. Uh, again, going back to the uh, Crystal Skull Society with Mr. Nasserino. And when he started to do the research, his group basically gave these categorizations to the skull in order to describe different crystal skulls that either were being found or were being created. Or can I ask you another question? Sure. Who, 
how how were the ages determined? Like you have one, the ancient, that's fifteen hundred years ago, and then you have the crystal, the old crystal skulls that are put in a category of one hundred to fifteen hundred, and then you have contemporary. So how did you get the ages? How did you know that was the age of the skull? Well, these were the uh, ways to create the classifications that they did, which was by how long ago where the skulls created. As far as the age goes, well, the contemporary or modern skulls we know because we know the carvers who make them. For example, Rosalita, and even in the picture you're showing of me now where I'm holding my other crystal skull, Portal de Luz, we know who the carvers were that made them. So we give this classification a modern skull or contemporary. As far as old or ancient, it is very difficult to be able to find a system that's going to precisely date when a crystal skull is carved from a physical perspective. And the reason for this is, is that quartz crystal, which is the crystal skulls that I study, um, let's say for an example there was um, a Mayan culture a thousand years ago where they had a carver and, the, and they uh, had a skull and a high priest would say to their carver, hey, we have this crystal skull which has been with us for thousands of years. I don't like the way it looks. And the carver starts making some kind of adjustment. May I ask you another question? How many of these ancient skulls are around? Okay, well, first, I think before we can answer that question, the individuals need to understand a little bit better why people are calling skulls ancient. Now the ancient skulls would be those that were created in the definition you read over 1500 years ago, which again is very difficult through physical means to know whether it is or not. However, either working with the indigenous people or sometimes working with sensitives who have put the objects in front of them, they start to link into the history because the crystal skulls we believe have the ability to record everything that happens around them like through pictures and energy and information. And a person who is sensitive can sit with the skull and kind of feel like, you know, I think this might be ancient or not. But one of the things that I want to impress upon the listeners is, is that the, it doesn't really matter the age of when a crystal skull is created, whether it's an ancient skull or an old skull or a new skull. And the reason for this is because based on our experience, when a crystal skull becomes activated, when it finds its true guardian, whichever one of these it is, there is a living consciousness that people start having contact with. In other words, they start talking to their crystal skulls. Okay, to wait a, a minute. Okay, just for example, to a scientist, if this, if you tell them this, they'll say you're insane. An inanimate object cannot speak. But what's happening is there's some kind of spirit or. Uh, interdimensional being that's able to work through the crystal skull to give a kind of intelligence and through a medium that we interviewed because we're starting to do uh, interviews with different mediums they were talking to us that this is a way for extraterrestrials and interdimensional beings and spiritual beings to have a contact with humanity because we're already familiar with the shape of the human bone skull so a lot of times, like when you're looking at a skull, it, it just feels like when we're with our personal skull okay, but, we're kind of talking. But Joshua, I don't understand. How okay. can, if somebody in modern times carves a crystal skull, I, what do you mean it gets its power from, from something else? How, how does that happen? Well, I believe that quartz crystal in particular has the ability to act as a dimensional door. And because it has this capability of acting as a dimensional door, it could allow other levels of beings that exist. Like, for example, as I'm sitting here and speaking with you, I can feel around me that there are invisible friends who are assisting me and helping me. What is the best way to explain things for your audience or what information I should share in this evening? Now, from a physical perspective, you know, if other people are looking at me and what I'm doing, they say, Joshua, you're alone. There's no one around you. But we are connected to many other levels of existence and dimensions, parallel earths and other dimensions. And there are 
You know, like when UFOs disappear, we say, you know, it was right there and all of a sudden it's gone. Well, it may still be there, the extraterrestrial craft is there, but it's gone into another dimension. And a person who is a sensitive can see that. So this is what I'm trying to explain is, is our experience is that these other consciousnesses that are around us sometimes will use it to go as a communication device and it looks like it brings it to life. It has a personality, it starts asking for certain things, it wants to have certain experiences. So we call our crystal skulls crystal children. So if, 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 if somebody in my family decides to, they have a talent and they get a crystal and they carve it into a skull, they'll be able to get powers with it? Not necessarily. And the reason for that is, is because uh, just because an object is in this shape does not mean that it immediately has power. It depends upon who's the individual that has the skull. Like for example, if a person who has the skull, let's say, had past lifetimes where they were a priest or a priestess in a temple working with crystal skulls, encoded in their DNA, encoded in their, in their vibrational frequency, we believe is the ability to work with the crystal skull, open it up, activate it, and it might begin to have this. It's not something that just immediately happens because somebody carves it in the shape. Similarly, with the very old skulls, or the ancient skulls, that have been found, like we met some of these when we were in Mexico in 2009, some of them have very powerful energy, healing energy, enhance the person that's in their presence, Others of them have a very harsh energy where, uh, like for example, there was uh, one particular skull I was working with, I actually became sick because the energy and the frequency that had been recorded inside of it with the civilization in the Mesoamerican cultures that had it, who knows what they were doing with it. Okay, let me ask you. For sacrifices oh. or... They were not honoring what the crystal skulls represent. Okay, I have a question then. Okay, so does it have to be in the form of a skull? It, I know that psychics um, will have a, a, a piece of a large piece of crystal that will, they'll have uh, it sitting on their table while they're doing readings, but it's not in the form of a skull. Right. Well, the. The challenge with crystal skulls is, as with anything else I believe, is each person has their own particular way in which they work with their spiritual gifts. So there are going to be certain people that are going to resonate because maybe they have past lives or maybe it's because of the shape of the skull that that's the tool that's going to work with them in a powerful way. Similarly, we've had people come to some of our presentations or even been in the presence of some of our personal skulls, and they yelled and screamed and ran out of the room because that shape was just, there was something about that shape that they couldn't deal with. I remember we were in Boston, there was a lady who came to a presentation we did, and she could not bear to look at the, the skull from the front, its face. She couldn't look at really? it. Really? So what we did is we turned it around, and we, we worked with her with the energy, and all of a sudden, before the end of the evening, she was completely comfortable with the crystal skull because it was about the energy. It wasn't about the shape or the form. Now, I think when it's put, when a piece of quartz crystal is put into the shape of the skull, which mirrors the bone skull that we have, it has the potential to uh, work like an ancient computer, to store knowledge, information, energy, uh, in a different way than just a piece of quartz crystal, but because it's in our shape, it kind of works the same way as a human being kind of works. And that's what we see, you know, when the crystal comes to the right guardian and they're meditating with it, working with it, activating it, and the crystal starts to become alive and it gives you your name and it starts telling you about what kinds of things it likes to do and it starts working very similar to like a person. So really? perhaps spirit which is always looking for ways to help us to activate the divine person that's inside of us, said the shape of the skull is powerful, and this is a way that we can help humanity to awaken. We present them with these gifts that look like them. So no. it can be, in a way, what some people call like sympathetic magic, but it's not about magic. It's about universal laws 
and the way it works in the cosmos. Wow. I have a picture up and you, I'm sh these are your crystal skulls, I'm assuming, and they're all made of all different, um, there's quartz, there's, uh, they're all, they're made out of different um, materials. So what are they? Well, you have uh, smoky quartz there, the big skull in the back, amethyst, rose quartz, That's clear it. quartz, and then you can't really see it, but we have one skull there called Tachula, which was actually found in the ground in Mongolia, which is an old skull. So, and that's the skull that says that it protects us. So each one gets a name, and each one has a certain way that it works with people. Now, you sell these as well. Well, what we do is we have contacts with Chinese carvers and Brazilian carvers, and people will come to us and they'll say, I'm interested, maybe they just want to start with a small one, or whatever, so we try to help them to find the right one, and we don't say we really sell them, we say we try to find the skulls their homes. So, and, okay, go ahead, I'm sorry. And this year, for whatever reason, we've sold more skulls, and we found more homes for crystal skulls than I can remember. And so, if we, if we buy a crystal skull from you, what happens? How does it get activated? Well, what happens is uh, people will ask us to have the skull sent here first so it can spend time with the ones that you see behind you and and Katrina is very good at listening to how the skulls want to be activated initially and prepared so when they go to the true guardian they go to their new home they're ready to work with and assist that person and I see we're kind of running out of time can we give to the oh audience? yeah no no go ahead go ahead I want to see if the viewers have any questions so go okay. ahead Okay, I wasn't sure if we were doing half an hour or an hour. Uh, well, oh, uh, we can go over. Go ahead. Okay. So, did you want to go with some Yeah, I, I, w I want to know if um, I've got my question. <laughs> uh, okay. You were saying something. Go ahead and finish. So I was just going to offer to the viewers uh, our websites, how to find us, and about, you know, the conference that we have coming up. Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So, it's really easy to find us on the internet. Um, our main website is crystalskullexplorers.com. Our email address is crystalskullexplorers at gmail.com. And then the, uh, the new conference, which uh, the title of it is called Crystal Skulls into 2012 and Beyond, because we're intending to do more conferences. This is a, what we call an online conference. They can find that either on crystalskullexplorers.com, I put a, a link to it on that page, or we have a specific page, crystalskullconferences.com, and that will t take them to the page where we're talking about, you know, this conference. We have different people we're inviting to speak, and I'm getting all kinds of new ideas of things to add to the conference. We'll have a, a photo gallery, a raffle of 10 skulls, 10 lucky people will get skulls, and it'll be completely online, which means that all the person has to do is just connect into the website where our digital room is and they can watch it in their home and if they can't make it it'll be recorded they can watch it later so oh it oh be good is that yeah um i want to see that um okay does that, any of the viewers have questions for joshua we're starting to wind down now any questions guys in the chat i'll give you a few seconds and okay now joshua i want to know what is the price range of your skulls? Well, the little tiny ones that we have available can be anywhere from maybe $25 to $45. Oh, is then, that all? Uh, we have some other ones that are larger than that that will go between $100 and $200. So that's the high range of the skulls that we sell. It's about $200. But if somebody wanted one like Rosalita, which is you know a human-sized one, we're talking about thousands of dollars. So we try to just uh, have skulls that are affordable for people, you know, which are smaller size. But we've had uh, someone, I think, a couple hundred dollars got about a seven or eight pound skull through us. So it just depends what the carvers in China and Brazil have too and what people are looking for. Okay, uh, Live Sci-Fi has a question. He wants sure. to know, are, are your skulls exhibited anywhere? No, the crystal skulls that we have are personal ones and so you know they're only 
exhibited when we get to do our public events like conferences or lectures, etc. So they're not. But there are some that are publicly exhibited. There's one in the British Museum in London, uh, which has been there since uh, 1898. And there's another one in a museum in Paris, which has been there since the 1870s, uh, I believe. Uh, not that particular museum, but in Paris. It moved to a new museum built within the last few years. Mexico City has some crystal skulls in a museum there. And then there are other guardians who travel, some with some ancient skulls, who again also, like ourselves, are doing public events at different places. Okay. So, oh, I'm sorry. That's what's available. Um, now, Life Sci-Fi does have another question, and that was a question I was going to ask, but I just want to ask one other one. Now, because your skulls, they're, they're in different sizes and they're different prices, is there a difference in what they can give as far as powers? No, size is irrelevant. What it really is about is the person who is receiving the crystal skull that they feel the affinity with that particular one. Like for example, sometimes we put pictures of uh, the skulls that we have available and somebody will go right to one and say, this is the one that's speaking to me, the F to M. So size really doesn't really matter because the material, the quartz crystal it's made from is still acting as a doorway to other frequencies and dimensions. So it's really not about the size. It's more about that the frequency of the skull matches the person that feels the connection to it or who's looking for it. So if I bought, say, a, a $20 or $45 one, and I wanted, what would, what would that do for me? If, if you could get it activated for me, what would it do for me? Well, I can only uh, give you some examples because every time a person gets a crystal skull, the experiences they have with it are unique and it's not really, it's unpredictable. A lot of people use their crystal skulls to try to have more peace in their life. They'll meditate with it and they'll try to have a, a peace of mind, clarity of mind, understand their purpose. Some people, when they become ill or sick, you know, they don't feel good, they'll actually hold the crystal skull, excuse me, do a meditation, maybe do a meditation with music, and they will get released. Other people work with their crystal skulls and it helps to enhance their spiritual gifts. I remember there was one time where I did a session with Portal de Luz, which is that large smoky behind you, mm -hmm. uh, with a young man in uh, Indianapolis. He was meditating and all of a sudden his third eye popped open he started seeing colors had never seen before around me. So it's kind of unpredictable. But basically what the skull does, I believe, is it sends out an energy pulse to the person who is its guardian or caretaker, and it knows from the response to that energy pulse how can it assist the person in that specific time. And then the crystal skulls change over time to their energy. Like for example, Portal de Luz was a very dark smoky quartz and now he's much lighter and I've actually seen some time where certain people are holding him and he almost becomes clear at last which according to scientists is impossible that a solid object made out of quartz crystal is going to be changing its um, color and the way that it looks internally. And this is part of the process what happens when the skulls come to their guardians is they start changing their physical form over time. Now what about if somebody brings in a crystal skull into their home and their home is haunted and they have bad entities and, and uh, poltergeists in their house, what happens? Well, there are people who have actually used, whether it's quartz crystals or crystal skulls, in such cases in order to um, help the spirits that are there in order to move to where they need to go because it'll raise the frequency that's inside of the house and bring it more in balance. Any kind of place, my understanding and my experience has been with poltergeist or ghost, is a lot of times these are lost souls or parts of souls that are lost and um, because the people that are living in the, in the home have no clue because they don't even believe that this exists there's no way that they're able to help these spirits or this energy in order to move to a, another place. 
But if the crystal skull has been activated and it has, uh, let's say you've taken your crystal skull to sacred sites, so it's recorded and picked up very special frequencies and energy, or you've been working with it in special meditations, like we have a world peace meditation that we do with the crystal skulls on the 13th of every month at the 13th hour. These higher frequencies and energy with the crystal skull may have recorded or been activated inside could actually change and, and help those spirits to move on or uh, for the spirits to even be aware that, you know, they don't belong there or they're dead or, you know, they're not in the place they need to be or it could open a dimensional door for, you know, there are light spirits that help lost spirits to go to the places they need to be. The skulls could open up a door for them. Let's see. Now, Julie, um, the whole idea is the intent as all the abilities, actions. Julie, what is your question? Oh, that's Julie's question? Okay, that's not Julie's sure question. Or, the whole idea is the intent as with all abilities, actions, and deeds. Right, she's just commenting on what I said. Oh, okay. Now, Black Sci-Fi and I both had had this. We were going to ask you this. What about December twenty-first? What's gonna? What's what's happening? Okay. Well, this is uh, what I've received from my invisible friends as far as what I think is going to be going on. Number one, the world is not going to come to an end on December twenty-first, twenty twelve or into the beginning of 2013. Um, what I think is happening right now, and I think it's going to intensify in December, which was why I felt it was so important that we did this conference at the beginning of December, to bring in these very powerful energies that are connected with the Crystal Scope, to start building with all the other groups who are going to be doing meditations and ceremonies and activities, etc. I think what's basically happening is, is that we're coming to a very important part in history where every individual on this planet is going to be making a decision. And what the decision is about is exactly what the Hopi prophecy shows that I've seen that's on their sacred stone near Arabi, Arizona. And that is every person is going to be making a choice. Whether they want to go into a new earth that has peace and harmony and understands the spiritual essence of our being, or whether they're going to choose to uh, continue on an earth where we have a lot of the challenges we have today, where you know people are fighting with each other over religion and philosophy and way of life and color of skin and so on. I think the world is going to divide into two parts. Now, there was one medium that we spoke to who offered an interesting interpretation of this. And there's no way that I can validate this, but it, it makes sense. So when I have opportunity, I share it with people to consider it. Because uh, what I've discovered for myself as I've had this contact with Crystal Skulls is it's actually helped for me to be in a much more calm and peaceful state. It's like, you know, you watch the news and all the people are having trouble and problem, but for whatever reason, for myself, everything is just, you know, it's okay, it's just going fine, you know, sometimes there are challenges, but, you know, it's not like, it's life-threatening. So what the medium said was, by the year of 2015, which agrees with what I'm receiving inwardly, that we're going past 2012, the Earth will divide into two Earths. And she called one Terra and one Earth. One Earth is going to exist in the fifth dimensional frequency. This will be the frequency of peace and harmony. It could be the place where the Bigfoot go. You know, we have a lot of SETI and Bigfoot that seem to disappear. They seem to be in some other dimension of the Earth. And then there will continue to be a third dimensional frequency of Earth where the people who stay there are going to have to continue to go through these kind of challenges like what we're having now. You know, what we see on the news and so on. But there exists the possibility, if this happens according again to this being that was speaking through the channel, I think it was an extraterrestrial being, that those that go into the fifth dimension will have the ability to come back into the third to help the people in the third dimension so that they can transcend and go into a time of peace and harmony. Okay. So that's what I, I kind of 
am leaning towards is that there will be kind of like a division, but it will be based on a person's spiritual frequency and energy. And the other key is, is that if more and more people would visualize in their mind and see the world being in complete peace and harmony, then we can co-create that together as the family of humanity. Wow. Um, there, Julie did have a question and then we have to go. Did, okay. um, she wanted to know if you were linked to Crystal Collective Sites. I've never heard of that, so I would have to say no. Okay. Um, and you gave out all the information that you wanted to give to the viewers and, and your website and everything? Yes. Okay. Crystal Skull Explorers is the best way to find us on the internet as well as to find out about the conference that we have coming up, Whoops. which we're very excited about. Well, I want to thank you so much. I, it was such a pleasure to have you on the show tonight. I thank you very, very much. I, I really appreciate you being our guest tonight. Um, it was a pleasure. Thank you, Noreen. Oh, yes. Any, anytime you would like to bring us back, just let us know. We're involved in a lot of different areas with the paranormal and just doing our best to share information for everyone. Oh, thank you. I, it was, I, I thank you so much for being my guest. It, you were awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Noreen. Okay, good night, Joshua. Good night. Oh, okay. Okay, guys, I don't have but a couple of minutes because I want to make sure I get this on YouTube. Um, we got a really good show coming up next um, next Thursday on the 25th. Um, Live Sci-Fi is going to be joining me, and we're going to be doing a special on the Haunted Sally House. And we've got David Weatherly, and we've got Joe Centero, Centrino, who has written a book uh, on the Haunted Sally House and the Beast Within. And it's going to be a good show. So um, I hope you can all join us next Thursday because I will have a show next Thursday, uh, same time. And um, so that's it. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the show. And I try to bring you uh, great guests um, every other Thursday. From now, now I'm just doing every other Thursday, but we'll probably start back every Thursday because I can't stand not being on. So everybody have a wonderful night. Have a great weekend. And I will see you uh, next Thursday night. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody.